I have not been um, this excited to talk to somebody on the air, and I, I don't know how long. Uh, somebody who I think in a in a wasteland, in just an absolute wasteland of uh, of journalism, if you can even call it that anymore. There are I, I can't even think of anybody really besides this individual that has courage to continue to do the right thing and continue to tell the story. I think Cheryl Atkinson will go down in the history books um, as um, a leader in this uh, time period, somebody who, um, against all odds, stood. And if it wasn't for technology, uh, she would be discredited and she would be out and nobody would ever know the truth. But because of technology... She had the courage to leave CBS News after fighting in the inside for a long time, leave and then start her own website uh, and and really go out and be on her own so she doesn't have to answer to anybody. With everything that we have found out um, uh, from Judicial Watch this week, <clears throat> everything that she has done in reporting on Benghazi, and tonight on For the Record, we take the the ball a, a little further. We have evidence now tonight that this was um, uh, all about gun running. Uh, pretty much everything that we said two days after this has now been verified. The story has been in production for a year, and it uh, debuts tonight. But we wanted to have Cheryl on to talk a little bit about Benghazi and also her experience at CBS News. Cheryl, it is an honor to talk to you. Well, that is so nice of you. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Um, Tell me, uh, when you saw Judicial Watch come out uh, with the story yesterday that um, the emails uh, between the presidential advisor, who is a brother with the president of CBS News, how did you feel? Well, on a, on a competitive level, I was jealous because I have FOIA'd those same documents, and, you know, like many in the press, were just ignored. They, they kind of, in my opinion, flout freedom of information law. So Judicial Watch has the muscle and the attorneys to file lawsuits. That's how they get their documents. The rest of us can't get them. And CBS wasn't willing to file a FOIA lawsuit when I was there to try to get some of these documents. But, of course, I knew about the relationship between uh, Ben Rose, the assistant to the president, and the president of CBS News. And there had been a little bit of reporting prior to that um, involving Rose and some of the talking point matters. So... I wasn't terribly surprised, but I was glad to finally see some written documentation that sheds a little bit more light on all of this. So, um, Cheryl, does journalism even exist anymore? I just got back from a very um, top-line investigative reporting conference at Berkeley, and it was very interesting because there's some just amazing reporters in print and television who attended sort of an invitation-only event, Pulitzer Prize winners and, you know, top people, and they really sounded the alarm over what's happening with journalism and in society at large. These are reporters that work for or used to work for the New York Times, the L.A. Times, um, a lot of these publications, and they see something, as they say, fundamentally changed in society with the freedoms, of the, the, the restrictions on the press freedoms, as well as civil liberties being given up pretty much voluntarily by people so where in society. Are they? Where are they? You're the only one I have seen that has actually stood up, that is a, is a credible journalist that says, look, I, uh, you know, here's what's going on. There's nobody else that's doing this. Well, look at uh, James Risen from the New York Times, who's at the conference I mentioned in a keynote speaker. Um, he may be put in jail for not get, giving up uh, information on confidential sources as the government continues their war on leaks more aggressively than ever, I think. Um, it takes some time, and the problem is, it's not just the ground-level journalists who have to try. It's the management and the managers that have to, and the show producers, be convinced that these are stories and that there's a real issue here. If not, you know, we're sort of like screaming into the dark and nothing really comes of it. So are you saying that they're just... Uh, I mean, I find this really hard to believe because everything was a scandal under George W. Bush. Everything. Um, and now nothing is a scandal. So it uh, it just strikes me as this is their guy, and they're not going to say anything about it. Um, are are you are you saying that the the management at these places really don't see that this is a problem? 
I think, um, indeed, managers don't see a lot of these as stories, or they would put them on television, or are in some cases so ideologically conflicted that they know there's a story, but they really don't want the story out there, even when it's fairly reported, lest the public, you know, draw the wrong conclusion with their own brains about what they see and hear. That's my opinion. And I write about some of this, and, you know, I'm taking time to write a book that tries to put some of this in perspective, because it's not so easy. It's not simple as though it's just a bias by a person. It's, it's, it's I think, a bunch of factors have come together in sort of this perfect storm to create where we are today. Yeah, your book is called Stonewalled, um, and it comes out when? This fall, doesn't it? Hopefully November if, you know, the schedule could slide, but it's scheduled for November. How, how, how did you have the guts to leave? And, I mean, uh, I mean what, what we did is, you know, we left Fox and started our own network, and it was insane. Um, and you're the only one that I have seen that has taken this this leap, and I hope that it's working out for you. I mean, you, honestly, I pray that this works out for you. Um, and anything I can do to help you, you just let me know. I think people should, <laughs> whatever they can do to help journalists who actually have the courage to tell the truth, no matter where the chips fall, good for you. Well, thank um, you so much. I, I don't see how it doesn't work out because, A, I don't have to work. You know, I've put myself in a position where the kid's college is paid for, and I'm, you know, I, I do sympathize with other journalists that can't um, stand up for sometimes things that they want to because they have bills to pay and families to raise. I get that. I'm in a good position now, so um, I don't see a downside to anything I do, and I don't, I don't really have, I don't see myself in the future being beholden to a single master that gets to decide every, you know, how every story goes, and more importantly, which stories don't get to see the light of day, which I think is almost a more but serious issue right now. When you had um, your computer turn on in the middle of the night, um, and they were, you know, they were they were hacking you and going in and trying to find out what you were working on. I mean, we're entering a time where you know we're a long ways away from it, um, but we can cover this ground quickly. We're at a time that we are starting to treat j- journalists the way Vladimir Putin treats journalists. Well, and you don't have to, you know, it's not me saying this, or me alone, or you alone. It's, it's as I said, a core group of, you know, top-level journalists who work at most every major publication and have sort of under the radar, as far as the public's concerned, raised objections about these things. But uh, Jill Abramson from the New York Times has been talking about the mm. oppression by the Obama administration of the press. Um, other, you know, New York Times reporters, Washington Post, all the networks have signed on to a letter objecting to the White House over some of its press practices, which they said um, are worse than the previous administrations, and raise constitutional questions. And I agree with all of these uh, news media outlets that have raised these concerns. So it's not just one lone person saying so. It's, it's a giant group of people, and I, I think we'll be so, starting to see more on this. I don't know in what forum, but I do sense that people know there's a real problem here. I assume this is going to be in your book. Can you take us through what it felt like when, uh, when you realized, holy cow, people are, I mean, they're coming after me? I've always had that in the back of my mind because of the kind of stories I do, although in the past I've been more concerned about certain corporations than government. But um, I had been warned for some time prior to the discovery of my computer intrusions that I was probably being monitored. Um, I have very good sources in government corners. So it sounded a little paranoid to me, but these are people I respect very much. And of course, this was way before the Snowden revelations and the Associated Press revelations. So um, it did sound a little funny at first, but once once we were able to confirm some of what was happening, I, I as I've said, I'm outraged. I think people should be um, just standing up on buildings and screaming about this, because if if someone is willing to compromise you know, the press, or whether they were going after sources or trying to intimidate me. Um, these are things that are, I think, very sensitive in a society that we have today, that, that these attempts would be made. I'm trying not to say too much more. I, I'm going to let my lawyer comment on um, more specifics of this, okay. hopefully in the not-too-distant future, but I, it's a lot. It's very technical, and I don't want to... Okay, so, can, so let me change the subject here. Let me, let me go to back to Benghazi. You're investigating uh, Benghazi, and the one thing that I said when it first happened, I said, look at how bad this must be. This is like day one. Look at how bad this must be 
that the president, during a campaign, when everyone, he, everyone wants the president to look like he's in charge and very presidential, he immediately says, by the way, I went to bed. I, I mean, I, I didn't even know what was going on. I, I had a meeting at 5, and then I just disappeared. Well, how about this? You know, I've, some people have given me more perspective in the past six months than I really had thought of at first in government sources. Not only was there lack of action, at least in the opinion of people who work in the government, and say we could have done more that night, not only was there lack of um, effective action during the course of six, seven, eight hours, they pointed out that the Cairo embassy event had happened eight hours plus before that, and that by the administration's own account, there was violence expected or impending at you know many, many embassies and places in North Africa and this part of the country, why were we not moving forward? It wasn't just six to seven hours that we seemed fairly paralyzed by the what they call the fog of war, whatever it was. It was, you know, a huge, long amount of time. Why weren't they moving assets? Um, they, you know, it's, it's, it's a greater period of time that there was inaction than we originally thought. And I, I think, you know, for a couple of weeks I didn't cover this story. I wasn't originally assigned, and I was brought in. CBS asked me to look into it. I think it was about three weeks in when it looked like there was, um, you know, some some more information to uncover, and just the stonewalling of basic information that should be publicly available, such as the commander-in-chief's action on a night when basically people were at war with Americans and that we were under threat in many places in the region. We don't even know what the commander-in-chief did that night. We're not allowed to know, and I think that's pretty shocking. What, what, what do you suppose? Was he involved, or is he? Is I, I he because he strikes me as a hands off the wheel kind of guy that he's just like whatever. You guys take care of it. I think this is um, my opinion, just based on experience. There were probably two narratives developing that night. One was in case there was a good scenario, um, you know, perhaps the ambassador uh, rescued in a heroic attempt, which I wish had happened. I, I think there are probably photographs of White House officials in the Situation Room looking com- in commanding and in control and that those photographs would have been released had this turned out better. That's why I've asked for the White House photographs taken that night, and the White House photo office went from telling me the very day I asked that I could have them to referring me to Josh Ernest, a press officer at the White House, saying that he had to release them, and that's been a year and a half. He won't return my calls or emails. So I think there are probably dual narratives, and the one that we got is the one in which the president were either not allowed to know what happened or he was uninvolved. Um, um, it, because if, how, you're, if, you're, if you're facing an election in eight weeks and you're the politicos watching this explode yeah. on that night, you're trying to think of every, every possible scenario and outcome and how to make that you know, work for the, as for the candidate, in addition to those who are obviously trying to troubleshoot the situation you know, that was going on. So we now know, um, we now know that um, we were on the wrong side that um, uh, the uh, Muammar Gaddafi had said, he's, I'm, I'm ready to give up, I'm, I'm just help me out here. The uh, opposition has uh, agreed to a replacement for me. I'm just going to leave. We just need the United States to sign off. We now know that we didn't. We now know that we were shipping guns over there. We armed Al Qaeda. We know that Rhodes wrote the memo that said, "Hey, let's uh, let's kind of keep focused here on this video. We don't want to talk about the failed foreign policy or anything like that." Um, w- we know all of these things about Benghazi, which make it really bad. Make it really bad for Hillary Clinton to be on the tarmac and tell the the parents of those who died, "We're going to get that video guy." Um, we, we know that she blew up and said, what difference does it make? It makes an awful lot of difference because you were lying to us. It, do we, A, know everything that, do we know the worst at this point? And is it even going to matter? Well, I think in part what I see as a strategy has been somewhat effective. They just needed to get through the election without as much of this coming out as possible. And as it has dribbled out in the year and a half since, we're getting sort of, you know, this. I've seen this before in, you know, different administrations and different politicians. You get a little bit numb. Little revelations come out a little bit at a time. If all of, all that we know today had come out the week after Benghazi, it would have really been disastrous. I think would have changed the would have changed the election. But, you know, they to some degree. I think 
what they've tried to have happen to make something that was, you know, quite disastrous, incremental, and then they had time to politicize it or at least make it appear as though it's a political issue only and controversialize it. Um, this is, isn't this what we did? Successful. This, was, this is what they did with uh, Bill Clinton. Isn't this what we learned with Bill Clinton? When, when Bill Clinton, the Monica Lewinsky scandal came out, everybody was shocked and they said, oh, well, that, it's not true. It couldn't happen. And then when we found out a year and a half later that it was true, everybody said it doesn't matter anyway because well, it all just came say, out in dribs and drabs. And they say it's old news. I mean, there's certain mm-hmm. strategies, again, that I've, I've seen, patterns of behavior, that I'm sure I'm not the only one, whereby, um, and again, I'm not just saying one party is worse than the other, but they have a strategy whereby information is, I think, kept close and then released in dribs and and leaked and a document here and a document there and pretty soon you're kind of numb and then pretty soon they say it's old news and I think again to some extent that works with the public but there is a slightly more informed group of the public that does pay attention that um, that isn't fooled by that type of strategy and they're watching and again uh, Cheryl Cheryl's new book is is called um, Stonewall Stonewalled and you can pre-order it Right now through Amazon.com. It's not released until November, but uh, you can get an early start on that right now. Um, Cheryl, I, I, again, can't thank you enough for the work that you do. Um, your website is Cheryl Atkinson, um, and uh, it's CherylAtkinson.com. And um, we just appreciate everything that you do and, and wish you uh, all the best. Well, thank you so much. And some of the proceeds from the book are being donated to the uh, Breckner Freedom of Information Center, which will help uh, on some of these issues. Are you, uh, can, can you, you know, I said when I first started to look at this administration, this is maybe eight months into it, I said this is going to go down as a more corrupt um, administration than, than probably the Grant administration. Can, can you compare what you think um, this is going to be looked at as history, what this time period is going to be looked at? I can't speak to that aspect of it, but I can tell you from the standpoint of press freedoms and reportings, I think this will be seen as a historic time of restrictions and a time in which we not just lost but voluntarily relinquished a lot of our our duty and our authority as watchdogs of the government. Um, Cheryl, thank you. I I hope we get it back. I hope we get it back. Me too. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Bye-bye. You bet.